Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Lloyd Alavan. I'm the politics and government reporter for San Jose Spotlight. Welcome. Hi, I'm Lorraine Gabbert. I'm the freelance reporter for San Jose Spotlight. Welcome to the backbone of Silicon Valley, a live forum about our new documentary series highlighting the plight of essential workers in Silicon Valley during the pandemic. These are the people who kept San Jose moving while the world stopped, and they still do. And thank you to our sponsors, the Knight Foundation, Working Partnerships USA, the Santa Clara and San Benito Counties Building and Construction Trades Council, Excite Credit Union, AARP California, and a special thank you to the Silicon Valley Community Foundation for your investment in this storytelling project. Backbone of Silicon Valley is a first of its kind video storytelling project. Our reporters spent the past year documenting the plight of six essential workers in Silicon Valley, the unsung heroes who clean your house, pack your groceries, cook your food, work in hospitals, and deliver your meals. San Jose Spotlight teamed up with filmmakers, including Jonathan Velasquez of Pelican Media, to tell their stories. The stories were emotional, raw, and unfiltered. They revealed deep injustices and social inequities of the wealthiest city in the world. We released the first two videos this week. Here's a sneak peek at what's to come. All right, so today we have Spanish and Vietnamese interpreters on hand for this meeting. Uh, and uh, to hear the event in English, please select EN channel after clicking the world icon next to the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. If you are using a smartphone, you will find it on the three dots on the corner of your screen. Spanish and Vietnamese participants can listen to the event by following the instructions on the screen. Uh, one of our panelists will be speaking in Spanish during portions of the event. When she does, you don't need to do anything. Our interpreter, Clara will be interpreting into English. Just make sure you're always in the EN channel. Uh, and if anyone has trouble hearing or speaking during the meeting, please select my square and you can chat with me. Uh, we ask all English panelists to speak slowly so the interpreters can keep up with you. And lastly, before we get started, attendees are welcome to ask our panelists questions using the Q&A box below. All right. With that, let's go ahead and get started with a quick introduction of our panelists. And we have four of them today. Uh, we have Yurina Guzman, uh, house cleaner in San Jose, Rina Salaga, uh, retail worker at Safeway in Los Caros and Rite Aid in San Jose, and uh, Dariush uh, Mubarak, a gig worker who drives for Uber and Lyft uh, in the South Bay area, and Jonathan Velasquez, uh, our filmmaker and founder of Hello Good Media. All right, so with that, let's get to our panel. Okay, the next questions are for all three of our panelists. Yurina, what are the biggest misconceptions you face in your line of work? And how do you wish people would perceive you and your work? Hola, muy buenas tardes. Otra vez me presento. Mi nombre es Yurina Guzmán. Yo soy organizadora comunitaria con Luna Latinos Unidos por una Nueva América. Soy organizadora del movimiento de papeles para todos, buscando la buscando la ciudadanía para todos, ¿verdad? Ah, pues ah, creo que fue un momento muy muy ah, muy estresante porque la gente no cerró la puerta, ¿verdad? Porque tenía el miedo a la pandemia. Ahora Cómo, cómo, cómo fue, um, cómo en este momento todavía está pasando, porque todavía están 
con mucho miedo a realmente esa respuesta quisiera tenerla, pero ni siquiera las personas de, 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 de que están al frente de la pandemia tienen esa respuesta, ¿verdad? Teníamos, todos los, teníamos como todos los artículos o todas las herramientas para ir a trabajar, pero en medio el miedo ganó ante cualquier situación, ¿verdad? Entonces, um, ¿qué es lo que quiero decir en este momento? ¿Es que seguimos igual o cada vez peor, verdad? Como, como indocumentada y trabajador esencial, seguimos siendo invisibles y seguimos siendo um, incluidos en la Her volume went down. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Um, Rina, how about you? Can you please share your thoughts? Um, yes. Well, my thoughts are um, what happens is. Uh, People think that when they we put on a name tag for whichever facility that we're working at, um, they tend to think that we have absolute control over every aspect of the job, from ordering to the temperature, to the supplies, to uh, the staffing. And the problem with that is that we don't. Um, when a customer's not happy with something, we're the first people that they speak to. We're the ones that they get mad at, that they want to vent to. And what we do is we try to facilitate it to the correct person. But what happens more often than not is they don't want to speak to the right person. They don't want to take the time to get the action corrected. Um, they think that we have everything to do with getting that change taken care of. And all we can do is write it down and send it in. And then sometimes the next time they come in and see that the, that their um, request hasn't been fixed, then they get more angry. But what I would really like is that if somebody's not happy with something, no matter which line of work that you're in, if you if they would just please respond to the appropriate people that can make the change and correct it. Don't take it out on the person in front of you, screaming at us and, and shouting at us or being rude or snide to us. It's not gonna change the situation and it's not gonna improve it for anybody around. So that's what I, I hope that people will get from this. Thank you, Rina. That sounds incredibly frustrating. Are you, can you please share with us your experience? My experience? Oh, no, Doryush. My apologies. Oh, no. I'm sorry, but thank you for sharing with us, Rina. Thank Doryush, you. Doryush, can you please tell me a little bit about your experience? No, and this is in regard to which app are we talking about? This is- Because I've done, I've been involved in many gig economy apps. Um, how do you wish that people would perceive you and perceive your work overall? I see, overall. Um, so my experience, what, um, what was told earlier, I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, let's say in regard to delivering with, uh, uh, with DoorDash or Grubhub or Postmates or Caviar or Uber Eats. Uh, so... People have got the same uh, impression, as she mentioned, that um, you know we are we are actually working for the restaurant. We are not working as a restaurant, you know. We are independent contractors currently. We are on our own as far as scheduling, and so we have got nothing to do what goes on in the restaurant and the food preparation, as she mentioned. That's just one example as far as food delivery goes. They ask you all sorts of questions, which we only just pick up the food from the restaurant and deliver it to the customer. And that's about it. 
Uh, of course, we are responsible, let's say, uh, making sure all the order are, uh, everything is there as far as what they have ordered. Um, but uh, we have got nothing to do how the food is prepared. <laughs> you know, getting a call, okay, why my food is like this or like that? Why is it, why uh, we asked uh, for, a, uh, for a vegetarian and they provide us with a non-veg, things like that, you see? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let, let's hear from our uh, filmmaker who was so instrumental in, in uh, this process. Um, so uh, Jonathan, uh, what drew you uh, to partnering with San Jose Spotlight and what did you take away from this project? Hey y'all. Um, you know, like a, a lot of my background, I, I, I spent working in the nonprofit world in the government space. Um, so for me, like once I really got into filmmaking, it was it was sort of like a uh, this understanding that that there, there's always these narratives, these stories that go unsung, unheard. There's yeah. so many thankless workers out there, you know, in, in a variety of different sectors. And um, for me, like to be able to to capture what these folks did and and the more i i got to be there with them and heard their stories the more i was like wow um even this, this last one that i filmed with like uh, dariush um it, it really shifted my my perspective on on just the amount of work that they actually do and what they really put themselves i was i, I felt like i was on an i told dariush uh, like i was in an episode of cops with him just running around as we were like <laughs> doing doing the DoorDash orders, you know, it was it was intense. It was a lot of physical labor and we're just running around. So um you know I for for me like I'm I really hope that that people look at this and they're able to to see a just a tiny glimpse of uh the struggle that, that all these folks had to go through. Exactly. Yeah. That's why they really are the backbone of Silicon Valley. So yeah, now yeah, back to our out. Great, like um, yeah, it, it was. It turned out great, and I uh, really got to see you know uh, uh, everything you know. Um, so uh, right now we have a trailer for a sneak peek for uh, the rest of our uh, backbone of Silicon Valley series that uh, we're going to show right now, and we're going to see Jonathan's great work. Okay, now back to our workers. So Daryush, our reporting revealed some incredible injustice, not receiving a mask or adequate pay or sick time, for example. What needs to change with the system and how should government and other agencies address these problems? Uh, you're right. As far as the system goes, yeah, the whole system has to change. Uh, um, the main important thing should be uh, a law which governs all the states. That's my point of view, uh, because these gig companies, they, uh, uh, they think they, they can get away a lot of things. Uh, Uber and Lyft that threatened to move out of state. Yeah. Why? They can, get, they can get away in other states. So government, the central government should step in and whatever rules are applied in regard to Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, all the gig economy apps should be applied universally in all the states. That's one thing I'm, you know, I'm mentioning because it's so important. They have, uh, Uber and Lyft have, have uh, repeatedly said that 
uh, you know, in case that uh, the drivers, the Uber and Lyft drivers become employees, then uh, it's not going to be a good thing for them. They won't be making money. They have to spend a lot of uh, money on benefits, which they are trying to avoid by keeping us in the, as independent contractors. And that's how, that's how they created that Prop 22. So that, you know, they, they created a law and they lied to the uh, community, they lied through the app, they lied through the TV ads to people saying that, uh, you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you vote yes on Prop 22, it's going to be good for the drivers. I don't think any, uh, any, um, any gig company really cares for the drivers. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Daryesh. No problem. Mina, um, what do you think can be done to improve conditions for workers? It would be nice if we all worked in a perfect world where um, everything, all, everybody's needs were always met. Um, I'm very grateful that I have a union that can help me and that has been helping us. I know that when there were shortages of masks or hand sanitizer fields, I know that they stepped up and they helped us with that. And I'm very grateful for that. What I would really like to see is um, um, compensation. Um, there was a time frame where we, that some of our employers were supplying uh, uh, the supplies to us, the masks, the shields, and hand sanitizers. Um, but when supplies got limited, we had to keep our own money to buy some items. And it would be nice if we had gotten compensated for that. Um, I'm hoping that that'll be added to our union contract in negotiations, um, hoping that they'll be able to add that. It would be nice if all of the states would add some type of a clause where they have minimum wage clauses. It would be nice if they had a pandemic clause attached to that minimum wage um, so that something does happen that uh, essential workers like LaRouche and Yurina and myself um, will be able to have supplies that we need to continue with our jobs. Thank you, Rena. I appreciate that. Uh, Yurina, what do you think needs to change? Um, hablo desde, desde el concepto de, de la vida del indocumentado, ¿verdad? Si bien las personas que están documentadas, ¿verdad? Tuvieron dificultades, para nosotros fue peor. Nosotros perdimos los trabajos porque los negocios se cerraron, porque nos dijeron no hay más trabajo. Nosotros estamos enfrentando desalojos porque no podemos pagar la renta. Nosotros estamos enfrentando que no tenemos um, aseguranza médica, un sistema de salud que nos pueda ayudar. Un momentito. As you can imagine, life is hard for me uh, because I come from the point of view that I'm an undocumented. You can imagine the, the hard time that everybody had during this time of pandemic, it was even worse for somebody who is undocumented, undocumented as myself. Um, it was very hard for me to uh, do things because things were shutting down. Also, um, because people were being told to leave their houses and the places where they live. And also insurance, medical insurance. It's very hard for somebody like me to have medical insurance. She's going to continue, one moment. Continue, Yurina. Mm -hmm. um, aparte de eso, estamos enfrentando abusos laborales. Y tenemos que enfrentarlo porque no tenemos otra opción. ¿Me puede repetir? Abusos laborales y qué más? No le escuché bien. Um, abusos laborales um, y uh, tenemos que enfrentarlo porque no nos queda de otra verdad. Oh, ok. Gracias. Un momento. And besides all of that, um, we also have to confront situations where there's abuses at the workplaces. We have to face that situation where there's injustice in our workplace. Algo más, Yurina? 
la comunidad de migrantes indocumentada fue la que tuvo más alto índice de muertes. Also, the people that are undocumented, that was the community that had the highest index of deaths. Thank you, Irina. I know that's really difficult, um, but we so appreciate everything that you have to share as well as the other panelists. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Rina, you talked about customers threatening you. Yeah about spitting on workers, about being verbally abusive when supplies were running low in the store. What made you want to get up every morning and continue going to work when you were doing this and are getting such abuse? Not every customer is like that. We have, um, I'm sorry, what Yorina was saying, uh, really no. felt, sorry. No. I did too. Um, so, thank you. Um, not every customer is like that. We have amazing customers as well. Those, those customers that help us, that protect us, that stand up for us. Those are the reasons why we go. They have families that they need to feed, um, whether they're small children, whether they're elderly parents. And it's not every customer does that. Um, they... There are the customers that stand by us, that help us, um, that speak out for, you know, the injustice. They explain things because we can't always say, I'm sorry, I, I'm not in charge of the ordering or I, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't force that person to wear a mask. Um, a lot of those things think that a lot of customers, excuse me, um, some customers believe that we need to be policing situations when that's not part of what we do. Um, we're there to make sure that the customers get rung up and taken care of. We try to meet all of their needs with what we have available. And sometimes there's limitations and they're not happy with the limitations. Um, our management teams at my facilities have been very supportive. Um, that we'd always have a manager there, like if somebody would begin to start something or would start to escalate, uh, we were, we were, we felt safe. I, I felt protected. I felt supported um, during, during all of those types of situations. Somebody was always there on the floor to help us. If need be, they would just take over the, they would just take over the register. And that made me feel safe enough that, yeah, I can come to work. Yeah, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to be attacked. I, I've got somebody there that, that can protect me. Um, and it's all of the customers, the children, the elderly. I want to make sure that they have what they need. They need their medication. If we're not there to do all of the things, how will they be able to be able to carry on? How, how will they be able to stay healthy? How will they be able to be their children or their parents? How will they be able to go on? It's just not every customer was like that, but it's nice that we had the support of so many other customers and I thank them all very much. Yeah, very powerful. I'm so glad, I'm so glad you had that support, Rena. Yeah, yes, yeah, definitely, thank you. Uh, and before we move on to the, the rest of the panel, um, apologies for earlier, but, um, we do have the trailer and we're sending it up right now and we promise we'll have sound this time. So uh, once again, uh, apologies, and but once again, here's the trailer for Backbone of Silicon Valley. You're thinking, well, wait a minute, people have to get food. People have to come in, they have to get their prescriptions. Sometimes customers can get a little aggressive. That was a little scary. The whole purpose is just to make billions. But the bottom line was, if we didn't do it, no one else was going to do it. It was like every day just telling family, I love you, I'm here, I'm okay. Uh. That was great. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let's uh, go to Darush. Um, Darush, I know you've been uh, involved in a lot of local organizing efforts to improve the conditions of gig workers like yourself in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, from your experience, what do you think needs to be changed to help support gig workers? A lot of things has to be changed, of course. Uh, the first thing will be um, uh, making us employees. The foremost important thing that's lacking. Uh, we don't have a voice because uh, we are independent contractors. We are not employees like uh, other, you know, like any other jobs, yeah. you know? So that's the first thing needs to be changed. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, like a couple of months ago, um, uh, one of the judges in San Mateo County declared Prop 22, which was created by the gig companies as being unconstitutional. Hopefully that will be the first step uh, for us to get to that point uh, where all the gig workers, and as I mentioned earlier, this should apply to all states. Now, in regard to, um, uh, so in regard to, uh, you know, um, uh, PPEs and, you know, masks and all that, uh, which I was, uh, so, so there was an ordinance. I, uh, I went for that action in San Francisco. Uh, there was an ordinance which actually passed in San Francisco. And again, unfortunately, it only applies for the city of San Francisco. Um, so we demanded all the gig workers, um, uh, we demanded that uh, things needs to be changed as far as gig company, gig companies being held liable uh, to provide PPEs uh, to the um, uh, gig workers, to the delivery workers, and also um, um, to provide PPEs. And also um, the delivery drivers get paid for the time spent in cleaning the vehicles. Now, uh, that ordinance passed and um, in San Francisco, all the delivery workers uh, are supposed to be provided with PPEs and time spent to clean their vehicles. But once again, this is only for the city of San Francisco. The system has to change. It should at least apply for all over the Northern California or you know, um, you know, the Bay Area. Unfortunately, that's, that ordinance it applies only for the city of San Francisco. And of course, um, uh, you know, uh, these gig companies, uh, um, have not paid, uh, um, you know, uh, have not paid the time spent for the delivery drivers to clean the vehicles. Uh, of course, there is some phone number uh, that the delivery drivers in San Francisco has been provided with. So in case of a complaint, they can call and, uh, you know, uh, report that. Uh, but um, hopefully things will change. Hopefully uh, one day, uh, you know, we'll have a voice uh, uh, because, um, Till then, till till we are still independent contractors, we have got we, we cannot do anything about that. We are on our own, as far as supplies, as far as uh, benefits at work, as far as pay and uh, everything else. So, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. for sharing that with us. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask something of all three of you. Did you learn something new about yourselves from sharing your stories with us reporters during the filming of these documentaries? Um, Rina, what did you experience? I experienced that um, I'm more resilient than I thought I was, um, that I'm stronger than I thought I was, and I'm more tolerant than I thought I was. Um, I find myself um, trying to help any of my coworkers any way that I can, the best way that I can. Um, I stay safe. I wear my mask all the time. Um, I'm hoping there's gonna be an end, but I don't think it's gonna be soon. Um, we're all learning from each other and um, I still have a lot to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Yurina, 
what are your thoughts? What did you learn about yourself through this process? Um, de igual manera, aprendí a que era muy fuerte. Y también aprendí a utilizar las herramientas de organización para levantar mi voz y poder compartirlo con la comunidad. Gracias, un momentito. Uh, same as you, I learned uh, to become strong. I learned to use the tools that are available to me uh, to organize myself, uh, to speak um, for myself in one voice and be able to share it with others. Algo más? También, también entendí que sola no iba a poder salir de esto y que los necesito a todos conmigo para que juntos podamos llegar a la recuperación y levantar nuestras voces para ser escuchados con fuerza. And I also um, got, uh, I also understood that I cannot do this by myself, that all of us need to work together, that together we can raise our voice and we can be strong together uh, to do something about this. Thank you, Yurina. Thank you both so powerful. And Daryush, can you please tell us a little bit about your experience, what did you learn about yourself through the process of working with us? Uh, what, what do you exactly mean, working with you as far as? Um, as we made this documentary with you, um, what did you find out that you were capable of or what did you learn about who you are as a person through this process of the pandemic and through the filming when you had time to really think about what you've gone through? Um, so, so I realized that, you know, uh, I've taken a lot of risk last year. Um, a lot of risk and also, um, you know, um, have uh, contributed a lot to the community uh, by, uh, you know, delivering food to the customers and uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, being an essential part of the community because people were staying home, um, you know, they were, they were doing their part not to spread the disease. And uh, we had to take a lot of efforts and risks to be able to, you know, serve them. And, um, and I guess, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of other people too. I mean, we had to all work together and, uh, uh, you know, um, and serve the whole community as general. Thank you, well said. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you. Not a problem. All right. Great. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, Yurina, uh, you, you said that the life of an uh, undocumented immigrant is a life of uh, stress and, and daily challenges. Um, and uh, as an activist, you're helping give undocumented people uh, a voice and courage to fight for their rights. Uh, how can policymakers and leaders better support undocumented workers like you? Ellos no quieren, ellos no quieren apoyar a la comunidad inmigrante. Los legisladores que tenemos en este momento estamos enfrentando una traición. Ok, un momento. They uh, do not want to support us. The legislators at this moment do not want to su support us. Um, there's a outright confrontation right now. Algo más? Es por eso que en este momento, y como lo dije en el documental, la pandemia nos despertó. Tenemos que ponernos a trabajar educándonos y luchando en contra de esa legislación 
que nos quiere ver indocumentados para siempre. And this is, and this is what I said uh, in the documentary, uh, that we need to wake up, um, that we need to work, and that we need to uh, fight so that we fight against the situation where others want, to, want us to be doc undocumented forever. And um, yeah, just thank you uh, for your thoughts. Um, you know, this next one is for um, all three of you. Uh, I'll start with uh, Yurina again. Uh, Yurina, how challenging was dealing with uh, the pandemic mentally as you came into work every day? Fue estresante porque no quería, no quería llevar el virus a la casa, no quería poner a mi, a mi familia en riesgo o a mis otros compañeros con los que compartí. Entonces fue tan, todo el tiempo pensando, me contagié, los contagié y ver a otros compañeros que uh, se contagiaron también fue muy, muy estresante. Al final sí llegó el COVID a mi casa, ¿verdad? Uh, pero fue muy, muy estresante. Ser ese vehículo de contagio uh, y ponerme yo enfrente en riesgo fue muy desafiante. It was very challenging. It was very stressful because you always have uh, the fear of the virus being around at work and you always thinking, am I going to bring this virus to my home? Am I going to give it to my uh, co-workers? I was always thinking about these things. And in the end, the virus did arrive. Uh, COVID did come to my house, um, unfortunately. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about uh, you, uh, uh, Dariush, um, how, how challenging was it dealing with the pandemic mentally? Uh, yeah, it was worrisome, you know. I mean, uh, with every delivery, uh, you know, I myself was very cautious per delivery, um, you know, thinking, am I going to get this from the restaurant staff? Am I going to get this virus uh, from a customer uh, who is waiting at the restaurant to pick up his order? Uh, am I going to get this um, um, uh, coronavirus uh, from other delivery drivers waiting in the restaurant to pick up the food? So it was, it was very worrisome. And of course, uh, uh, as she mentioned uh, regarding, uh, am I going to bring this disease to my home and infect others because um, you know, even after the vaccine was uh, created, uh, the fear is that, okay, we are protected, not getting sick, uh, but we can still carry the disease. So I was thinking, okay, I may be okay, all right, but will I be a carrier of the coronavirus? Am I going to infect my family at home? So a lot of worries and a lot of tension, of course, you know, so. Yeah. Wow. I wanted to interpret um, something that was mentioned in the chat in Spanish. Uh, Migdalia Rodriguez said in relation to what was being talked about earlier, she said that with DoorDash, uh, there's more hours that uh, you spend, about 58 hours a week. Not all those hours are paid. In other words, it's only about 39 hours a week that are active. And, and this means that the essential worker loses about 58 hours a week. This is very hard and sad. Wow, yes, definitely that's a lot. Yeah, um, how about uh, you, Rina? Uh, how is it uh, dealing with the pand pandemic mentally? Um, well, it was always, always have to take a deep breath, kind of um, go into work um, and trying to watch out for each other. Um, a lot of times um, we'd have a customer or patient not uh, behind the glass um, and sometimes it's hard to hear. So I found myself or a coworker of mine would be, you know, kind of moving a little bit away from the glass. We'd have to always remind each other, pull each other, 
you know, we need to stay behind the glass. We, you know, we have to protect ourselves. Uh, they, they have children. Um, I, everybody has parents and, and that, that we have to be concerned with. And I agree with Yurina and Darush that we're concerned about bringing that home. Um, with one of my positions, um, we do the testing. So I had to be very, um, very careful with that aspect of my job. Um, sometimes it'd be a little bit, bit more stressful. Um, sometimes supplies would be limited gloves, which we definitely need to handle um, those types of um, uh, specimens. Um, so I know that uh, we were anxious a lot of the times we were getting um, stress headaches. Um, I know that um, we wanted to take a little bit more of a break every now and then. Um, sometimes it gets a little bit fast paced. Um, other times, you know, on the other side, uh, we have the customers that come in. We'd also like to have supplies for them so that we can protect ourselves more. Um, Sometimes we just have to ask each other, how are you doing? Take a deep breath, you know, go take another break, you know, go get a glass of water, just something. Um, we have to be aware of everything. If we're touching our mask or what have you, we have to stop what we're doing. We have to uh, sanitize um, everything that we're touching and everything that we're moving around um, has to be uh, taken care of. It has to be cleaned. Um, trying to help customers wipe down their groceries before putting it in you know, in a bag or what have you to make them feel safe. That kind of makes you look at every aspect of your job and what you can do to improve on it and to make it safe because we don't want to take it home to our families. We don't want to take it with us. We, we don't want to be a carrier. Uh, we want to stay healthy. We want everybody around us to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, do you feel, uh, Rena, like your, your employers did enough to support you during the pandemic? Like, what could they have done to make you feel safer? I think that on both, both of my jobs, um, I think they did the best that they could with what they had. I know if there was a scare, somebody um, um, came down with it or thought that they had it or was exposed to it then we had a special team come in and deep clean everything. Um, that made me feel comfortable. That made me feel safe. Um, they supplied us with as quickly as they could with shields and gloves and the barriers. Um, it was so nice to see those barriers come up at the check stands. Um, it was very nice to have that support system. If we were concerned about, hey, I'm not comfortable with this customer's coughing or what have you, I had a management person come in and just ring them up and take care of it. It was nice to have that support. Um, and my union is just incredible right there, uh, standing side by side with us, um, with me through everything that I was going through. I mean, if, if I was stressed about something or whatever, I have them on speed dial. I just talk it through with them. Help me calm down, help me get through it. Help me work that out. I'm very grateful to them. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, Darush, um, I have a one for you. Uh, the life of a uh, gig worker, as you know, um, can be very unpredictable and, and very challenging, uh, especially as almost everything moved to a delivery model during the pandemic. And, and I wanted to know, did, did you ever want to quit? Like what kept you motivated to not give up? Uh, good question. Uh, you know, you have got family, you have got expenses, um, you know. Um, so, I mean, I, I had to keep myself motivated. Um, um, I've got some healthcare background in the past. So I'm very conscious of the transmission of diseases and viruses. Um, um, try to uh, keep, uh, you know, uh, myself and uh, my wife, we were... Uh, getting ourselves tested every now and then, uh, so to keep myself, you know, healthy and, uh, but, um, but that motivation, you know, that the people need us, you know, they need to, uh, they need the prepared food to be delivered to them. 
and of course, um, you know, um, just 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 being positive. Okay, you know, uh, I could I did maximum I could do to protect myself and my family. Um, as I said, getting my uh, ourselves uh, tested, um, sanitizing everything at home, whatever I touched, whatever I touched, you know. Um, you know, um, after uh, getting the food from the uh, from the restaurant, um, had to sanitize the vehicle every now and then. So, uh, so having that healthcare background helped me a lot uh, to keep myself motivated and keep on moving and taking all the risks. Um, so, when you are uh, you are conscious about what you do, uh, you know, as far as taking care of yourself, protecting yourself against the deadly disease. Although it was kind of scary at times as well, right? Uh, because there were so many unknowns, you know, even the doctors, uh, you know, uh, they, were, they, you know they, they, were not, they were not having enough information for us. You know, they were working on a vaccine and, uh, you know, um, God knows we were thinking, okay, when this vaccine is going to be out, so we have a peace of mind. But, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, just being positive, uh, just uh, taking precautions as much as I could, uh, using the PPEs um, and uh, sanitizing uh, whatever surfaces I, I could clean. And so just being being conscious about my surrounding and everything, and just uh, the thought of uh, you know people need me. You know I should do a better job. I should keep motivated. Today's over. I'll be there tomorrow for the community. Yeah. Great. Thank you, and and thank you to our our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, that that wraps up our pre written questions that we've had so far. So uh, we're going to open up to questions from the audience. And again, you can submit your questions using the Q and A function uh, via Zoom. And while we wait for um, some questions to trickle in, uh, I just wanted to open that last question to to everyone. Um, how how did you keep yourselves motivated um, during this pandemic? Um, Yurina, uh, can I start with you? Like, how did you keep yourself motivated? Um, lo primero fue mi familia. Eso fue lo primero, lo que me mantuvo motivada. En segunda, mi comunidad. Tenía que, teníamos todos que estar fuertes para enfrentar esto. La comunidad que se ha, ahora se ha hecho que todos somos uno y todos caminamos con cariño y respeto y con mucha compasión para salir juntos de esto. Eso creo que es mi, mi familia grande, la de la comunidad, y mi familia pequeña de mi casa. First of all, my family, that's what, that was uh, what hit, kept me strong. Second of, second of all, my community, um, because with my community, we were stronger. We were all as one. Uh, we were all caring for each other, having respect for uh, each other and allowed us also to have compassion for each other. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Rina? Uh, what kept you motivated during this pandemic? I, I agree with you, you know, family first and foremost. Um, the other thing is that if I'm not there to help my coworkers, that's my second family at each of my jobs. Um, I wanna be there for them. I wanna help support them in any way that I can. And I um, also wanted to make sure that the community in which I work in, I wanted to make sure uh, a lot of the patients and customers that I've been uh, helping, uh, I wanted to make sure that I could be there for them to make sure that they could get their, the medicine that they, they need daily. And I, I also wanted to make sure that uh, the community has food and supplies that they would need so that they could move, they could continue. Um, so yes, those, that's what kept me going. 
my coworkers and my family. Thank you. I want to thank Rena and Yurina and Daryush so much for your time and your heart and your sincerity. You have shared with us such important information. I hope all our audience members take it to heart. I really appreciate you guys and thank you for being part of our documentary series. You guys truly are the backbone of Silicon Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we, we do have one question from the audience uh, from Gloria. Uh, and her question is, how optimistic are you about the future and changes in the workplace that may or may not improve working conditions? Um, let's, uh, Darush, do you wanna answer that first? Hey, can it repeat it one more time if you don't mind? Yeah. Yes. Um, how optimistic are you about the future and changes in the workplace that may or may not improve working conditions? Like, a, yeah, just how optimistic you are, are you in, in, in the future about your working conditions changing? Um, no, this is in regard to working, con I mean, as far as supplies are you talking about or um, can it be specific a little bit more? Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, just how you're being treated by your employers like uh, DoorDash or Uber or Lyft. Got it. Okay. Um, so we have had a couple of actions um, uh, in regard to DoorDash. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we went to San Francisco. Uh, there was an action in front of... Um, um, Tony Chu's house, uh, we had we did the action at 303 Second Street in San Francisco. So we have, uh, we submitted the petition uh, to, um, uh, to DoorDash. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have made a request, uh, you know, what our needs are. Uh, so I think I depend uh, on what we did in San Francisco. Uh, we protested, uh, we gave our demands uh, to the um, to DoorDash office, and um, could be a slow process, but I'm optimistic uh, they would they would make a change um, hopefully uh, in the future. So um, that's the only thing uh, we can uh, we can do, you know, just uh, having some sort of action, protest, and let our voices heard. I went all the way from San Jose to San Francisco to take to part in those two actions. And uh, I did my part as far as representing San Jose in San Francisco. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, what about you, Irina? Uh, how optimistic are you? I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, I have my union UFCW Local 5. Um, I, they, they help give me a voice. I have San Jose Spotlight to get the word out. Thank you very much for that. Um, so that the communities and the world itself are realizing exactly what's going on. So that when it comes time for our union negotiations that we have a little bit more support from the communities saying, you know, hey, they are worth that. They are worth hazard pay. They are worth that higher wage. They are worth, um, the pay that they need if they have to go out. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic because of the I we have the we have the community we have San Jose Spotlight. Thank you so much for us get the word out. And I have my email. You know, um, and I think that the government are also waking up and realizing the need that's going on in the world today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what about you, uh, Yurina? Uh, how optimistic are you? Bueno, en este momento me siento sí optimista nuevamente. Eh, uh, número uno, por uh, me siento muy muy orgullosa y me siento muy contenta de trabajar otra vez con la comunidad. Uh, creo que Luna uh, ha trabajado mucho con la comunidad con mucho corazón con um, educándolos de cómo protegerse durante la pandemia y después de la pandemia que la recuperación va a ser um, creo que a largo plazo, ¿verdad? 
pero he trabajado con un corazón a la comunidad y estoy tan, tan orgullosa de pertenecer al equipo y de organizar en papeles para todos y que todos juntos nos hemos educado desde políticamente, organizacionalmente, ¿verdad? Para, que, para ver esto um, más, um, más a futuro, más a corto plazo esta recuperación, ¿verdad? Pero nuevamente con educación, con mucha confianza. Un momentito. Uh, I'm very optimistic, once again. Uh, first of all, I'm very proud and I am glad um, because I'm able to work with the community, with Luna. I'm able to learn, um, protect, um, and also help with the recovery uh, on the long term. Um, my heart is with the community. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm proud. Uh, I like to be a person that organizes the education um, and all of these things, not only on the long term, but also uh, on the short term. Thank oh, you. Well, I'm sorry. Algo más, Yurina? Claro que sí. Entonces, así como los compañeros um, tienen a la Unión Verdad que los respalda, y que está con ellos uh, de la mano. Nosotros tenemos a las, a las organizaciones que van de la mano con nosotros, dándonos guías, apoyándonos unos a otros. Así es que el futuro lo veo, es um, tal vez ahorita es incierto porque todavía hay muchas cosas que estamos enfrentando, pero con este apoyo que tenemos, creo que uh, uno por uno, hombro con hombro, Creo que vamos a, a tener una, una, algo bueno está por venir, ¿verdad? Ok, gracias. Um, and many of uh, my um, co-workers and colleagues here have the support of the union. Um, that is something that they're supporting them. But uh, with me, um, what I have as support is the organizations. Uh, they are helping me, they guide me, they support me. And uh, together, one by one, um, shoulder to shoulder, uh, we're able to get uh, things done, get many things done. Thank you. Thank you, Yurina and everyone. Um, I have another question from an audience member. Um, Gloria asks, besides being more understanding about needs of workers like yourselves, what one thing would you like the voters, the public to do? Can we start with you, Darish? Okay. Um, the voters uh, and the public they need to be, uh, you know, um, they need to be educated to what uh, the ordinances and the, the propositions and things like that are all about. So they won't get um, misguided by these tech companies. That's my understanding. There should be more education for them to know. Like, for example, as I mentioned earlier, the Prop 22, uh, only those um, many, many, many of the gig workers also were not um, knowing, uh, they, they were not having that much information about that. Uh, but um, but uh, the main thing was the public, the public were misguided, uh, totally. Um, uh, it was a proposition which uh, uh, could have made a, the, uh, a major change uh, for the future of the gig workers. Uh, being, uh, being an employee, uh, it means a lot. You see, you have a lot of uh, benefits. You have got your health insurance, you get your workers' compensation, your sick time, your vacation, um, you know, and you have a voice. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, so, so for the community uh, to understand our situation, there should be more education about the gig work industry and the gig workers. 
So in that way, uh, when they have to vote, they have got a proper knowledge. They are not going to just listen and watch to the add on TV, uh, which, which, is, which is only meant to support only their own benefits. What I mean to say the gig companies. So there should be more education uh, for, for the community so, so that they can better understand, uh, you know, um, uh, how caring the drivers, uh, whether Uber or Lyft, or the delivery, uh, the, the, the food delivery workers, which they were working during the pandemic. Um, so uh, yeah, just a, just a better understanding of what gig workers go through and, um, you know, and knowledge of that, and, and knowledge and understanding that these gig workers have got their families and they need, they need to take care of their families. Thank you, well said. Yurina, can you please share your feeling? What would you like the public to really know and to do? Con respecto a lo, estoy todo, totalmente de acuerdo con lo que Darush dijo, la educación para ver qué hay en, en el frente tras las votaciones, ¿verdad? O qué vamos a votar, o por quién vamos a votar, o qué nos qué consecuencia nos trae esa votación, ¿verdad? Para hacer estos cambios, creo que es muy importante. Entonces, nuevamente, como lo dije desde el principio, ¿verdad? La educación, levantar nuestras voces y de verdad decir no a lo que no nos beneficia a todos en general, ¿verdad? Y tener el poder de hacer ese cambio. Los votantes, o, los no, votantes no. o no votantes, los votantes, los que no podemos votar, influimos sobre los que podemos, los, los que pueden votar para que esos cambios vengan. ¿Verdad? La educación, la educación, muy importante. Ok, gracias. Um, I am in agreement, as Darush said, education is very important. Uh, voting uh, so that the changes can take place. Um, so that the voices of those people that cannot vote are also heard through the voices or through the people that can vote. Um, also to say no to those things that don't actually benefit every to everyone. Um, and this way, this the people that are doing the voting has the power uh, to give voice to those that cannot vote. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Rina, what are your thoughts? What should the public, what should the voters know? And what should they do? I, I agree with Darush and Yurina. I think that um, knowledge and education is key, but um, I welcome them to, to wake up to it. I welcome them to act on it, um, to actually do something, put, Yurina said, put some law um, so that we'll all be protected do jobs that we all do for ourselves and for everyone without having, <clears throat> excuse me, without having um, something tangible like that that can be enforced. I think that um, it would make it a lot harder for all of us to do our jobs in the capacity that we're able to do now. So yes, there should be something, there should be a law. It would be nice to have something mm -hmm. that we can refer to and say, hey, this is not right. This is the law. Thank you. Thank you guys again. Yeah. Thank you. And we have time for uh, one more question uh, from the audience um, from uh, or from Reka Arandares. Uh, thank and uh, panelists, if you could just try to keep it um, your response in one sentence. Uh, thank you for your sacrifice and hard work. What kind of workplace policies would have made you feel safer at work? Uh, Rina? Um, the policies, uh, the policies to keep me safer at work, um, 
if if the ones that were put in play were forced and if they were supported. Yeah, and um, Yurina? Mm -hmm. Bueno, que por esas me hubiera gustado es, um, me hubiera gustado escuchar um, que um, podíamos tomar los días, ¿verdad? Cuando, cuando, cuando no nos sentíamos seguros y de, de quedarnos en casa para sobreguardarnos, ¿verdad? Por lo menos al empezar la pandemia, pero desafortunadamente nosotros no tuvimos eso, ¿verdad? Eso me había dicho sentir seguro, quedarme en casa y, y pensar que iba, iba a tener una, un alivio, ¿verdad? Pero nosotros no pudimos tener eso. Esas pólizas no están a nuestro Es por eso que el pueblo se levantó, la comunidad se levantó y dijo, basta, tenemos que terminar con estas pólizas que nos están de nuestro lado. Y de verdad que no fue opción. Nosotros no podemos quedarnos en casa. Así me hubiera sentido más segura, pero no fue así. Y como yo, son 11 millones o más. Um, I, uh, like to hear what you're saying. Um... But I would, like, would have liked to have heard also in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, during those days that you were not sure what was going on and uh, you needed a little bit of uh, relief or uh, needed a little to rest a little. I would have had liked to have that time to be at home and rest and recuperate but we didn't have that um, comfort. We didn't have that advantage. Um, we still had to keep on going. Um, and that's something that we as a community had to experience. But we also as a community, we all got together and uh, we said, not anymore, we can't do this. And it's not only me, but it's 11 million people that said this. Yeah. And uh, Darius? I uh, can I repeat your question, uh, uh, Mr. Alaban? Yes. And uh, in a sentence, you know, what kind of workplace policies would have made you feel safer at work? Okay. Um, a lot of employers, you see, I've got also a W-2 job. I also do, uh, you know, part-time security work. And uh, I've got a lot of friends in different other industries. And so um, a lot of, not just the employer I was working, uh, working at, but a lot of employers, uh, they did not take the initiative uh, to uh, properly, um, you know, supply us with these PPEs. You know, that was, and, and the, 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 there was nothing you could do about it. You would keep on mentioning to a, to a site manager uh, and we would tell, okay, we need more masks, we need more gloves. Uh, but they would say that, okay, you know, the, uh, the main office, they are not supplying us with. So, um, I mean, there, there was no way that you could force them. So, uh, so the response, you know, so the thing is that the, 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 the policy should be such that uh, there should be some sort of a law forcing these employers to take responsibility and be liable, you know, as far as supplying us with PPEs. Hey, um, well, a oh. couple of people got sick actually at my W2 job. And, uh, you know, everything was kept very private from us. We didn't know what was going on. And that's how they handled it, you see. Um, yeah, so, th so the main thing is there should be some sort of a law that forces the employers to be held liable and accountable for, for, for supplying us uh, PPEs and uh, held accountable in case something wrong happens, somebody gets sick or something like that. Okay, well, thank you. And thanks again to all our, our panelists and to our audience. That wraps up our discussion.
And uh, I hope that this discussion gave uh, our viewers and our readers an intimate look at the challenges and risks that thousands of essential workers face every day as they navigate the pandemic, not just in the early days, but even now, nearly two years later. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, the Knight Foundation, Working Partnerships USA, the Santa Clara and San Benito Counties Building and Construction Trades Council, Excite Credit Union, AARP California, and of course, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation for making this project possible. A video recording of today's webinar will be available on San Jose Spotlight's website next week. And to watch the video documentaries and to learn how to support our nonprofit journalism and programming like this, please visit our website, sanjosespotlight.com. Thank you for tuning in. I hope to see you again at a future event. And thank you again, panelists, so much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.